I like this first verse of the 21st chapter. It just, it has a ring to it I just love. I just, you know, it just, it just hits me right. It, it, it resonates with something within my own heart. It just sort of, you know, sets the vibrations and it just, doom, you know, and it hits. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. That's so much like God. He did as he said. He did it as he had spoken. So he visited Sarah as he said. And he did for Sarah what he had spoken. God had promised, through Sarah shall thy seed be called. Sarah was past the age of bearing children. She had gone through the menopause. Abraham, his own body, a hundred years old, dead. Sarah's womb, dead. And yet God promised through Sarah thy seed shall be called. And about a year er earlier the Lord said to Abraham, At this season, at this time, this set time, Sarah shall bring forth a son. So God visited Sarah as he said. He did for Sarah what he had spoken. For Sarah conceived. God said it, that's what God said she would do. She would conceive. He visited her and she conceived. And she bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. So at that time that God said, he brought it to pass. There is with God a set time for all things. And God, because he deals with the eternal, has all kinds of patience waiting for that set time. Because I deal with the temporal, I have all kinds of problems waiting for that set time. And I so often am trying to speed up God's clock. I'm trying to hasten God's program. I'm trying to do things before God's set time. And that is a mistake that we often make. Not waiting upon God for his set time. Jumping ahead. Moving before God moves. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Laughter. That's an appropriate name. For when God said to Abraham when he was 100 years old, I'm going to give you a son by Sarah, Ab Abraham laughed for joy, really. He said, all right, you know. And he laughed for joy. Being strong in the faith, he gave glory to God. The laughter of Abraham was a laughter of joy. Later on, when the Lord was again talking to Abraham about the son in his tent and Sarah was hiding behind the tent flap. And the angel said again to Abraham, Sarah shall bear a son. She laughed. But her laugh was that of incredulity. <laughs> oh, you mean me? Are you kidding, you know? And, and hers was of disbelief, and so the angel sort of rebuked her. He said, why did Sarah laugh? And she said, oh, I didn't laugh. And he said, oh, well, but you did. So they both laughed at the prospect of having a son, so you might as well name him Laughter, which they did. Because, oh, what joy, what laughter they brought to their lives. What a, what a rich blessing Isaac brought to them. And on the eighth day, 
Abraham circumcised his son Isaac that he might become one of the covenant people with God. Circumcision according to the commandment of God. Now Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh so that all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Now, God really restored this gal. <laughs> Not only was she able to have Isaac, but she was able to nurse him. And here she is, over 90 years old, nursing her baby boy. For I have borne him a son in his old age. Now the Lord really rejuvenated Abraham too. Because Sarah died when Abraham was 137 years old. And Abraham, after the death of, of Sarah, remarried a gal by the name of Keturah and had six other children by her. So God really rejuvenated him. <laughs> so the child grew and was weaned. Now, the children were usually weaned at the age of two or three years old. They would nurse them for a long time. And so when the child was weaned, two or three years old, they decided to have a big feast. They celebrated the fact that they're going to wean the kid now, you know. And so the big feast and celebration and Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, who at this time was probably 15 or 16 years old, he was 13 years older than Isaac. Sarah saw this teenage son, Ishmael, laughing or mocking, scoffing. Now, he no doubt felt a jealousy for this son Isaac that was born. Because for 13 years he had been his dad's boy. The attention and the love of his father bestowed upon him. Though Sarah always had a hard time with him, Abraham, it was Abraham's son and he loved him as his son. But suddenly there comes on the scene now this little kid they call laughter. And everybody laughs. Everybody's happy. Everybody's excited. They're going around in ecstasy and in joy. And all the attention now is on this new little baby. Ishmael is sort of shuttled aside. He's not the center of attention anymore. And, and he's had a hard time dealing with this new little baby getting all the attention. So at the big feast that they called for the celebration of the weaning of him, he's sitting over there as a teenager just sort of, you know, scoffing and snarling at the whole situation. And Sarah saw him as he was mocking or scoffing at her son. And oh, you know a mother. And so she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with laughter. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, 
listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Now, Abraham had listened to the voice of Sarah and that was really the cause for Ishmael existing. God promised to give to Abraham seed as the stars of heaven. Abraham believed God and the very next thing, Sarah says, well look, I'm not going to be able to do it. Why don't you take my handmaiden, Hagar, go in and let her conceive and I'll take the child as mine. But as soon as Hagar was pregnant, there came a jealousy between Hagar and Sarah. I mean, it, it, there came a friction that never did leave. Hagar looked scornfully upon Sarah because she was able to conceive and Sarah wasn't. And Sarah was despised by Hagar and, and the feeling became a mutual feeling and there was this friction there. That all happened though because Abraham listened to Sarah. Later she got mad at him for the child that was born. But it was at her suggestion that it all took place. Now, this time, Sarah is saying, get rid of her. Get, cast that kid out of here. He's not going to be an heir with my son. And of course, Abraham loved Ishmael. It really was a um, disquieting thing to him to have to cast her out. But God spoke and said, listen to your wife Sarah and do what she says. So there are times, fellows, when God will say to you, listen to your wife and do what she says. Not always, but <laughs> there are times. My wife has quoted this scripture to me many times. <laughs> God said, Yet I also will make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your child. And so God promises that he will take care of him. He will make a nation out of him because he is Abraham's child. Now, when he was 13 years old and God said, I'm going to give you a son, uh, Abraham said, let Ishmael live before you. And God said, all right, I will bless Ishmael too and make a great nation of him. But through Sarah shall the seed be called. So Abraham had prayed earlier for Ishmael that God would bless him and the blessings of God would be upon him. God said, all right, I'll make a nation of him also. And so now as he is to be cast out, God said, I'll, I'll still make a nation of him, but Isaac is the one. Now, Paul the Apostle, when we come to the book of Galatians chapter 4 in the New Testament, quotes this experience of Sarah saying, cast out the bondwoman's son. And Paul brings an interesting kind of a parallel between the child of the law and the child of the spirit or the child of faith. And he draws some interesting parallels there in Galatians 4. There are always those who live after the flesh. There are always those who walk after the Spirit. But know this, they that are after the flesh will not inherit with those who are after the Spirit. We are to live after the Spirit. We are to walk after the Spirit. It is by the Spirit that we have become the heirs of God. And the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the child of faith. The child of the Spirit. 
we each of us in our lives always have those choices whether or not we're going to live after the flesh or live after the spirit. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He took bread and a skin of water and he put it on her shoulder and he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and she got lost in the wilderness of Beersheba. She wondered, the, the word is really, she, she became lost. He no doubt had given her enough water to get her to a place of civilization or a city where she could, or a community actually in those days where she could have uh, lived. But having become lost, the water in the skin was used up. And Ishmael fainted. She put his body under a bush in the shade. And then she sat across from him about the distance of a bow shot, as far as you can shoot an arrow. For she said to herself, I don't want to see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite of him and she lifted up her voice and wept. Must have been a difficult experience for Hagar. She's sort of a victim of circumstances. It's hard on Abraham. But Sarah is insisting that this child not be around to be an heir with her son. And so he sends her away. And now the boy is dying and she sits and weeps. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven. Notice the angel of God. Up until this point we've been dealing with the angel of Jehovah. Now, the name Jehovah is really the covenant name of God to Israel. The word Jehovah is literally the becoming one. Where God revealed himself as the one who becomes to you whatever you might need. And God wanting to be all to the nation Israel revealed himself as the becoming one to them that he might become to them whatever their need may be. And we read so much of the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. Probably the same angel, but Hagar is outside of the covenant. The son of the bondwoman will not be heir with the son of the Spirit. And so it is now called the angel of Elohim, the God over all. He called to Hagar out of heaven and he said, What ails you? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. So Ishmael was probably crying there under the bush also. Arise, the Lord said, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And then she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness. He became an archer and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. And he later had 12 sons and thus 12 tribes came from him. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and the land in which you have sojourned. And Abraham said, 
I will swear. Now Abimelech is the one that uh, the Philistine king, when Abraham came into his territory, he said of Sarah, she is my wife, and Abimelech took him, her into the harem and all. This is the same Abimelech. But now watching Abraham as he lived in the area, he could recognize that the hand of God was upon Abraham. He saw that God was with him and that God was blessing him and probably heard the miracle of the birth of this child and realized, wow, this is, God said to him of Abraham, he is a prophet. And he really recognizes now that the hand of God is upon the life of Abraham and he wants to make this treaty, this covenant. I've shown kindness to you. Now in the future I want you to show kindness to my children, to my descendants and all. I want you to promise this. Swear to me. And so Abraham swore that he would. But then Abraham took advantage of the situation to bring up a sore point because his servants had done a well and the men of Abimelech had come by force and taken the well away. So Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I didn't know that this happened. I don't know who did it. And you didn't tell me about it. I haven't heard about it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and he gave them to Abimelech. Now you remember when Abimelech sent him away, he gave him sheep and oxen. Now Abraham's giving some of them back to him. And the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Over in the side. Took seven ewe lambs and just set them out over here. And Abimelech said, what in the world is that all about? And he said, you will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand. That they are my witness to you that I'm the one that dug this well. So every time you see those ewe lambs, you'll know that I was the one that dug that well. Therefore he called the name of the place Beersheba because of the two of them that swore an oath there. Now Beersheba can mean the well of oath or swearing or seven wells. Shiva is seven in Hebrew, but it is also the word for an oath. Or swearing. So the well of swearing, or the well of seven, or seven wells. And both meanings are correct for the word Beersheba. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Phicol, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree, and there's a question whether it's tree or grove, many trees. Uh, you do that when you're planning to settle down, and you say, okay, we're going to settle here, is when you plant trees. And he there called upon the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, and this is the first mention of everlasting God, El Olam, the everlasting, Olam, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the land of the Philistines for many days. Now it came to pass after these things. And now we probably have a period of uh, 25 years or so later. This last instant, of course, that we had a date was the weaning of Isaac. Now some 20 to 25 years after Isaac was weaned. It came to pass that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Love is probably one of the most important words in the Bible and interestingly enough, this is the first time the word is found in the Bible. 
And there is a study of the Bible that takes the first use of the word in the Bible. And usually the first time that a word is used in the Bible sets the pattern for that use of the word throughout the Bible. So there is what they call first mention in biblical interpretation. And so when you're studying a particular subject, you go back to the first mention of that word or the first mention of that subject and you study the circumstances of the first mention to get a light upon wherever it is mentioned. So in the law of first mention, this is an important thing. The first mention of the word love in the Bible is interestingly enough, the love of a father for a son. Now we hear a lot of mother love, but the first mention of love in the Bible is not of a mother for her child, a husband for his wife, but it is of the father for his son. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom you love. Turning to the New Testament, what is the first mention of love in the New Testament? In Matthew's Gospel, we are told when Jesus was baptized, that the voice of God spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. The love of the Father for the Son. Mark's Gospel, the first mention of love, is also at the baptism of Jesus where Mark records the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. And as we studied last Thursday night in Luke's Gospel, the first mention of love is again at the baptism of Jesus when God said, This is my beloved Son. But what's the first mention of love in John's Gospel? We have the Synoptic Gospels, they all agree. What's the first mention of love in John's Gospel? Can you guess? Of course you can. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God's love for the world. My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God is giving his beloved Son. So God said to Abraham, Take now your son, Isaac, thine only son whom you love. God does not here recognize Ishmael. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Ishmael was the work of the flesh. God refused to recognize him because of the work of the flesh. He's not the child of promise. He isn't the work of God, the work of the Spirit. He's the work of the flesh. And so God doesn't acknowledge him, but acknowledges only that work of the Spirit, Ishmael. Take, I mean, Isaac, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest or whom you love. We so often are guilty of trying to offer to God the works of our flesh and we want God to accept them. God will not accept the works of your flesh. So much of the endeavor for God is endeavor in the flesh. That's one of the weaknesses and the problems of the church today. We are endeavoring in the ability and the energy of the flesh to do the work of the Spirit. The psalmist said, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Except the Lord watch the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. We're going to be surprised shocked and perhaps greatly disappointed when we stand before God 
and our works are then tried by fire. Because so many of the works are going to be burned. The works of the flesh. Those things that I've done in the flesh. Listen, I spent years, years, trying in the ability and the energy of my flesh to do the work of God. I tried for years in my flesh to build the church of Jesus Christ. And it all went for naught. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. And I'll tell you, I spent a lot of years laboring in vain. God doesn't recognize the works of your flesh. He wants the work of His Spirit in your life. So take your son Isaac, whom you love, your only son. Go to the land of Moriah. To offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. The land of Moriah was the area of Jerusalem. Abraham living down near Beersheba, about 30 miles away. You made 10 miles a day <laughs> walking. And so it was a three-day journey. And so Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey. He took two of his young men. And interestingly enough, the Hebrew word translated here, young men, is the same word that is translated lad for Isaac. So he was about the same age as these young servants that Abraham took, probably in their 20s. He took his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now, Paul, writing to the Corinthians, speaks of the gospel that he had preached to them. And he said the gospel that he had preached to them was that of Christ who died and was three days dead but who rose again on the third day. That's the gospel, Paul said, which he preached to them. And he speaks of it as being really uh, from the Old Testament. Now where do you have the teaching of the resurrection of Christ? How Christ died according to our sins. Uh, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. What scriptures? Where in the Old Testament does it say that he would be raised again the third day? And as I look at the Old Testament, this must be the reference to which Paul was referring. For, for three days, as they journeyed, Isaac was as dead in the mind of his father Abraham. Nonetheless, Abraham, the whole while, was believing in the resurrection. He could not understand what was going on. He could not understand the command of God. He saw a real dilemma, God's dilemma. God had said, through Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac didn't have any children. He was not yet married. So the seed has to come through Isaac, and yet God is saying, offer him as a sacrifice on the mount that I will show you, place that I will show you. So how can then Isaac have seed? The only way he can is to be resurrected. 
So in Hebrews 11, it said, By faith Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice unto God, knowing that God would, if necessary, raise him from the dead in order to fulfill the promise, Through Isaac shall thy seed be called. So Abraham is going in faith, the faith in the promise of God, that through Isaac shall thy seed be called. And on the basis of that promise, he was willing to make this sacrifice. God's word is going to be kept. Isaac is going to be the father of the race. God, you've got a problem. I don't know how you're going to solve it, but that's your problem. And so he came within sight of Mount Moriah. And as he came within sight of the mountain, he said to the two servants, You stay here. I and the lad will go and worship. Now, this is the first mention of worship in the Bible. And we sometimes sing together, close our eyes, lift our hands as we sing songs to God and we say, well, we've been worshiping God. Technically, that isn't what the Bible terms as worship. The word worship literally means to bow down. That's the literal meaning of the word translated worship. And what it is a reference to is the bowing down of my will to God. That's what God looks at as worship. When I bow down my will to God, God looks upon that as my worshiping Him. And that's what worshiping God is all about. You see, you can lift your hands and sing with your eyes closed, but you may be resisting God in your heart. You said, oh, I had such a wonderful time worshiping God today. No, you didn't. Because the worship is that bowing down of my will to God. And Abraham is saying to these boys, we're going to go up to that mountain and we're going to bow down our will to God. I'm bowing down to God's will. Going up to bow down, to surrender to the will of God. We will go and we will worship, we will bow down, and we will come again. Don't know how we're going to come again yet, but we will, because through Isaac shall the seed be called. So Abraham declares they're going to worship and they're going to come again. They're, the word come, we will come again. The word come is a plural verb. So it is we will come again. We will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac his son. Even as Jesus, they put upon him the cross and he bore it towards Golgotha. He took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went together. Not God will provide for himself, as you read in the New King James. That's a poor translation. I've spoken to the Nelson publishers about that. But God will provide himself. 
This is a prophecy of Abraham concerning Jesus Christ, God the Son, who was provided as a lamb slain for our sins. We are redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our vain manner of living, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ who was slain as a lamb without spot or blemish. As John cried, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. Marvelous prophecy. So the two of them went together. And they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there. He placed the wood in order. And then he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Isaac, 25, 30, maybe even 33 years old at this point. We're not sure. Possibly. The next event we read about is the death of Sarah and Isaac was about 37 when his mother died. His father now 125, 30 years old. Surely at this point Isaac could have overpowered his dad. He could have said, wait a minute, Dad, I see what's going on. None of that. You know, you're crazy if you think I'm going to let you go any further. And he could have overpowered his dad. But he submitted to his father. He allowed his father to tie him and place him on the altar. Even as Jesus in going to the cross, submitted to the will of the Father. He could have escaped it. In the garden, he prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, thy will be done. And then when the soldiers came to arrest him and Peter pulled out his sword and began to swing away, Jesus said, Peter, put away your sword. The cup that the Father has given me to drink, shall I not drink it? Don't you realize I could call ten legions of angels to wipe these guys out? But the cup the Father has given me to drink, shall I not drink it? As he was praying there in John 17, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with thee before the world ever existed. What shall I say? He said, I desire to escape this hour, but to this hour was I come into the world. Submitting to the Father, he went to the cross. Isaac, submitting to his father, was bound and placed on the altar. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. I imagine at this point Isaac was looking up at his dad. And he saw the tears rolling down his dad's cheek. Hardest thing Abraham ever did. I mean, this is the greatest test of faith he could ever have. Somehow God's going to bring this kid back to life. I don't know how, but, you know, he's got to be the one through which the promise comes. God has said, through Isaac shall thy seed be called. And, and there was that moment, father, son. And if you ask me, which one was suffering the most, Abraham or Isaac, Being a dad, I would venture to say Abraham was suffering more than Isaac. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, who suffered the most? Take now thy son, thy son whom thou lovest. This is my beloved son. 
And we don't often think of the pain of the father's heart when the son was being sacrificed for our sins. Abraham raised the knife. And the angel of the Lord, again not the angel of God, but back to the angel of the Lord, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad, the young man, nor do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. James gives to us a very interesting commentary on this particular passage of Scripture, declaring that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, but the proof that he believed God was manifested when he sacrificed his son. And thus, that work of sacrificing son was the proof of his faith. So that faith without works is dead, abiding alone. He uses that as a part of his argument that faith has to produce works that are corresponding and in harmony with what I declare I believe. And so the faith of Abraham was demonstrated in his willingness to offer his son. Abraham lifted his eyes and he looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh or the Lord will provide. And then he said in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. This is a prophecy again. Two marvelous prophecies by Abraham. The first one, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. Now he repeats it, declaring, the Lord will provide in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. This mount of the Lord being Mount Moriah. If you go to Jerusalem today and you go to the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount where so many sacrifices were to be made in later years is Mount Moriah. In 2 Chronicles we read, And so Solomon began to build the temple on Mount Moriah in the threshing floor of Ornan that was purchased by David. So there on the side of Mount Moriah, Solomon built the temple. Now if you will take a careful look at the geography of Mount Moriah, you will note that the Temple Mount is at the side, on the side of the mountain, not at the top of Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah continues a gentle slope from the Temple Mount up to the top. However, when Solomon built the walls of the city of Jerusalem, built the temple, and built so many of the buildings, on the north side of the city, the rock there is perfect for building. It lays in stratus and all they have to do is cut it and, and the blocks are, are practically cut. They just, uh, the way the strata of the rock is, it's perfect building block. And that is where they quarried the stone for Solomon's temple and later uh, Herod for the building of the wall and the Temple Mount and things of that, of that nature that Herod built. And so on the north side, Mount Moriah has had a great chunk taken out of it, a quarried chunk. 
But originally, at the time of Abraham, that stone had not been quarried out. And so from the Temple Mount, the gentle slope would have come all the way up to the top of Mount Moriah, which is now across sort of a valley from the wall of Jerusalem. So if you'll stand near Herod's gate, on the top of the wall of Jerusalem, though you are standing maybe 60 feet from the ground down below, the wall is only 12 feet high because of the bedrock that comes up there. And if you will look at the bedrock there and turn and look then across at the bedrock on the other side, you can see the configuration of Moriah, how that it was over on the other side, gently sloping, and the top of it was on the other side of what is now a valley where they have a street and they have the bus depot and all. But on the other side where they have quarried it, as the result of the quarrying of the stone, there are caves, and as you look at these caves, they look like a skull. And thus the name of the place became Golgotha, which is the place of the skull. Or in Latin, it's called Calvary, which has the same meaning, the skull. So that above the skull, Golgotha or Calvary was originally the top of Mount Moriah. And no doubt when Abraham went to the mount, he went to the top of the mountain, which was the customary thing. When you would build an altar, you would go to the top of the mountain to build the altar. So on the top of the mountain, Mount Moriah, where Abraham built the altar to offer Isaac his son, there 2,000 years later, because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son as a sacrifice for our sins. In the same place where Abraham built his altar is the same place where God sacrificed his son. And the prophecy of Abraham was fulfilled when he said God will provide himself a sacrifice in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And it was 2,000 years later. Take now thy son, thine only son, whom you love. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And so <clears throat> the picture of Abraham sacrificing his son is a foreshadowing of that which God would do. The heart of the father in love for the world sacrificing his only begotten son. Now, if God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how much more then shall he not freely give us all things? <coughs> then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven, and he said, By myself, I have sworn, says the Lord. Hey, 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 wait a minute. Whoa, look on now. The angel of the Lord, what did he say to Abraham? Go back to verse 12. He said, Do not lay your hand on the lad nor do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from whom? From me, the angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? None other than Jesus Christ. You've not withheld your only son from me. Again, the Father, the Son, the triunity of the Godhead. It's here in the Old Testament as well as the New. And so now, the angel of the Lord calling to Abraham saying, By myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, you have not withheld your son, your only son. In blessing, 
I will bless you. The book of Hebrews in talking about this said that God has a problem when he wants to make an oath to man. Because whenever you make an oath, you swear by something higher, something greater. But God can't swear by anything greater. So when he wants to make an oath and make it established and all, that, you know, I make a covenant, I swear, he has to swear by himself. <laughs> because there's nothing higher to swear by. So that God wanted to establish the promises by two immutable things. Number one, that it is impossible for God to lie. God swore by himself, declaring in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is by the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Now, for many years it was thought that there were only 3,000 stars in the sky. Before the age of telescopes, guys would sit out and count the stars at night. And there were several astronomers of ancient time who counted the stars and they usually came up with numbers in the area of three to 6,000 that are visible to the naked eye. Now, God couldn't have written the Bible because God here indicates that there are probably as many stars as there are grains of sand. And there are only 3,000 stars, and we know there's got to be lots of grains of sand. So the early skeptics cast their doubts on the, you know, the fact that God inspired the Bible because God made a severe mistake, uh, indicating that the stars really could not be counted because of number. But then along came the telescope. <laughs> and more powerful telescopes. Until now... It is estimated that the number of stars in our universe are 10 to the 25th power. Interestingly enough, it has also been estimated by the number of cubic feet of sand that exist in taking a guesstimate and the number of grains of sand in a cubic foot that there are probably... 10 to the 25th power grains of sand on our earth. So it is interesting that God would put those two together as the stars of heaven or as the grains of sand. They'll be innumerable. You won't be able to count them. It must have been that God did write it because at the time this was written, they thought there were only 3,000 stars. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, through Jesus Christ, all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because you have obeyed my voice. And so we become the beneficiaries of the obedience of Abraham. Blessed because of Jesus, who was born of the seed of Abraham. So Abraham returned to his young men. They rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Now, where was Isaac? As we mentioned this morning, it doesn't mention him coming back here. With Abraham, I'm sure he did. But the Spirit does not mention it deliberately. Because Isaac, being a type of Christ, after his death was taken up into heaven and will not appear again until... The servant, the Holy Spirit, brings back the bride for the Son. And the Holy Spirit is in this day gathering among the world a bride for the Son. And when the bride is gathered, then the Holy Spirit is going to bring the bride to the Son. And he shall arise to meet them in the clouds of the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But he, he doesn't appear on the scene again until the time of the bride. We'll get that in our next lesson, chapter 24. Now it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah 
has also borne children to your brother Nahor. Now, Abraham had his brother Nahor still living back in Babylon. He received word, and, and probably from a caravan or something, concerning his brother. Oh, yeah, I know Nahor. Yeah, his wife Milka. She's had a bunch of kids, you know. And well, what are their names? Well, Huz and Buzz. <laughs> Great names, aren't they? I love the names of these kids. Huz and Buzz. They must have been twins. Huz was his firstborn, Buzz his brother. And Kemuel, Chizid, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Man, what names. Now, Bethuel had a daughter, Rebecca. Now, Rebecca is going to come into the scene in a couple of chapters, and that's why she's mentioned here. And these eight Milka bore to Nahor, your brother. However, his concubine also had four other children. Uh, her name was Ruma, and she had Teba, Gehem, uh, Thehash, and Maka. And so, uh, 12 sons. How many daughters were born? We don't know because girls didn't count. <laughs> Tough, isn't it? Now, Abraham was no doubt interested in a wife for Isaac. It could be that he sent a servant back to find out how his brother was doing and whether he had any children or not because he really couldn't find a bride from among the heathen where they lived for his son Isaac. And so he was thinking about sending his servant back to his family. Nahor, oh yes, he had 12 sons. And, and, but you see, the sons of Nahor, or the daughters of Nahor, would have been much too old for Isaac because Isaac wasn't born until Abraham was 100. So the grandchildren of his brothers would be more the age of Isaac. And so it does turn out that Isaac then marries one of the grandchildren of Abraham's brother as we develop in the story. But this is just thrown in here to give you a little, you know, insight into what's coming. You know, the secret coder, here's clues of what's going to come in the next episode, you know. So uh, stay tuned and uh, in the next episode we'll find where Rachel come, or Rebecca comes into the scene. And that fabulous story, and, and again, the carrying on of this whole typology of Isaac, the type of Christ, and Eliezer, the type of the Holy Spirit, gathering a bride uh, for the Master's son. And we'll find a lot of beautiful, beautiful uh, types and all as we move into uh, chapter 24 and this fascinating portion of Scripture. Lord bless you. Give you a good time this week. Be with you. Watch over and keep you in Jesus' love. Amen.